Every Hanukkah, we sing a song, Mi Yemalel Gvurot Yisrael, who can we tell? Mi Yemalel Gvurot Yisrael means, who can tell the mighty acts of Israel? That's exactly what it means. Who can tell the mighty acts of Israel? Well, actually, the the author of that of that song, Mordechai Rabinovitz, I think it was, uh, he um, he was a secular uh, kind of a socialist Jew, and he wanted to uh, to reduce the theological freight of what he was saying about Hanukkah. But it actually comes based from on Psalm one o six, verse two, which says, "Mi yimalel gvurot Adonai," who can tell or can, who can speak of the mighty acts of Adonai or of Adonai's mighty acts. That's what it is. And tonight, I'd like to talk to you this afternoon, actually, I'd like to talk to you about uh, about telling the mighty works of God, about how we should go about telling the mighty works of God. And along the way, we're going to be looking at the life of Yiftach, who was a mixed bag, but God certainly used him. Our goal today is to learn how to speak to other people of God's mighty acts, because this is what we're called to. We're ambassadors for Messiah. Uh, and we're, we're emissaries of the kingdom. And what we should be doing is proclaiming throughout the world the mighty redemptive acts of God not only in scripture, but in our own lives. We're, we should be doing this, it's our responsibility, but it's also a means whereby our own spiritual life is deeply enriched as we speak to others of the mighty acts of God, as the people of the day of Pentecost did when they were speaking in tongues, all 120 of them simultaneously, they were speaking the mighty acts of God. We should also speak the mighty acts of God but how should it be done? Therefore, I want to say, let me tell you a story, or let me tell you about stories. Now, this is something which has become um, of interest to me recently, and I'm going to be exploring it deep, more deeply. I'm going to get a book or two about this, because I think this is a key idea that is uh, that needs emphasis in our day. The Bible uses stories, not bullet points. The Bible, I heard today, the Bible is a three quarters uh, stories. And, and uh, uh, the Bible doesn't uh, present truth to us in bullet points, but it presents story after story after story after story. In fact, the whole Bible is a story, a story of the mighty acts of God from the very beginning in the beginning, mighty act number one, God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, stories are really how we're wired. This is how humans communicate. Uh, Patrick Henry Winston, one of my favorite people who I've mentioned before, who was the head of the artificial intelligence department at MIT, and one of the premier developers of, of robotic intelligence, he wanted to discover what is it that makes intelligence human, uniquely human? What is unique about human intelligence, about human nature? And he decided that, uh, well, orangutans are about, their DNA is about 97% the same as ours. What's the difference between us and them? And he decided man is a storytelling animal. We tell stories instinctively. For example, when little children are playing, even when they're playing by themselves, what do they do? They play make-believe and they tell themselves stories. It's really obvious. And when little children play together, they, they don't have to be told to organize where, okay, you'll be you and you'll be that and I'll be this and I'll do this. They, they make a story up that they inhabit. Storytelling is intrinsic to human beings. And to come to a lively faith, to come to a faith that is vibrant, means finding your personal story in God's story. It's discovering, maybe you would see that you're already there before the foundations of the world. God intended for you to be in that story. 
but you find the meaning of your life in the meaning God is establishing in the story he creates in the story he tells. Stories are very important. Coming to a lively faith means finding your story and God's story. When each of us became Yeshua believers, the story of our life changed. We found a new trajectory for our life, a new planned ending, a new way of conducting our day for day life. The whole story of our life shifted. Let's look how that happens in the Bible with Paul. And I just looked at this this past week, and this is just one place where this this kind of phenomenon is is displayed. Paul says, for me to live is Messiah. It wasn't always that way. The story of his life, what his story was about, where his story was heading, was something else. But now, for him to live is Messiah. That's a very strong way of saying that that the Messiah's, uh, what the Messiah has done is everything to Paul. Messiah wants is everything to Paul. What the Messiah is doing in the world is everything to Paul. For Paul, Paul says, my life is Messiah. He says, it's no longer I who live. It's no longer my story that I'm working on, my, simply my story. It's no longer the old identity that I had, the old man. It is no longer that I who lives, but it's the Messiah living his life in me. A very strong way. He's not saying that my heart stopped and immediately I got the Messiah's heartbeat. He's not saying that. But he's saying that his life, the story of his life, the trajectory of his life, the planned ending of his life is, has been so shifted that the Messiah's priorities and goals and story inhabits Paul's life. He says, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul's story has become bonded with Messiah's story, Messiah's coming to earth, being born of a virgin, living a sinless life, suffering under Pontius Pilate, being crucified, dead and buried, uh, third day later r r rising from the dead, ascending to the Father's right hand, being seated in the heavenly places and throned in the heavenly places, pouring forth the Spirit from whence he shall come again to judge the, the living and the dead. All of that is, is what Paul's life is now interwoven with that. And so shall ours be if we issue as people. So I want to challenge us with something. I want to destigmatize faith sharing. Many believers never really share their faith with others. They're, they're intimidated. They feel inadequate. That's a great tragedy. Sharing your faith, sharing my faith, us sharing our faith is not so much argument, it's invitation. We're inviting people to make God's story their story. We're inspiring people to find their story in God's story. That's what it says there. How do we do that? First, I think we, I urge us that we ought to be in the habit with people we know of telling them stories from our lives at the right time in the right way, stories from our lives where God has been redemptively active in our life. Tell them your story, because they may end up bonding with your story. They may say, I, do I wish that story was mine. And you can lead them by seeing that your story, what happened in your life, is modeled in Scripture and grounded in Scripture. So by telling your story, you direct their attention to the Bible stories, and you don't even have to open up the book with them. Because I'm also saying that we need to internalize the Bible's stories so when we speak to people, we can say these magic words that people just about always say yes to. you mind if I tell you a story? People love that. People are born to hear stories. you mind if I tell you a story? Little children, when they go to bed, they want mommy or daddy to tell them a story. And adults, too. You say, you mind if I tell you a story? Give me, give me about three minutes. I want to tell you a story. You might tell a story from your life 
but you might also tell a story f- from scripture that is apropos to make the point with these people that you want to make. You might tell a parable that Yeshua tells. You might tell something from the life of Abraham from anywhere. And I'm going to get to what the implications of that are. are. The joining point for which, at which people join their story to God's story is their response to Yeshua, the Messiah, to who he is and what he has done. That's what we're aiming for with our friends, that they might might want to become part of what God's doing in the world. And they want to experience the redemptive pattern of what God did in the past. Over and over again, God has shown up to redeem our people. As it says in the Hanukkah song, in every age, a hero or sage arose to our aid because God was active redeeming his people. It says in Isaiah, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. And what I, what I like to say is that, that uh, the God who has redeemed Israel in the past has acted again and decisively in Yeshua the Messiah to rescue his people. And that, that's the pinnacle of the redemptive acts that go all the way back to the beginning. But when our friend becomes part of God's story, or when God's story becomes part of our friend, it's through understanding Yeshua's story and bonding with that. Let's go on. What is the good news? Just a little side issue. What's the good news? The good news is Besorot uh, Tova. The, the Hebrew word is Besorot Tovot, uh, uh, plural, the good news. Or Besorot Tova, the singular, good news. And what is, that means something very particular. We see that mentioned in Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who proclaims good news. What is this about beautiful feet on the mountains? Well, it applies to, to times of war, when a country, when a nation was in war. After the battles were over, a messenger from the battlefield would come running back to the homeland with a report. And if they came back saying, we won, that was Besorot Tovot, that was good news. That's what the word gospel really means at its root. It's good news of, of a battle having taken place in which we all won. And that's true in Yeshua. Yeshua fought, Yeshua fought a battle for the sake of the well-being of humankind and the cosmos in which we are all winners if we become part of that story. So that's the good news. And we want, when we tell stories to people from the Bible or from our life, we want to show God's redemptive action in turning bad situations into good news. Because he's done it again, and he's done it at the pinnacle through Yeshua, the Messiah. So let's talk now about Yiftach for a minute. I want to show you how his story is kind of a of a, of a gospel in miniature. It's a good news story that he could tell to others to lead them to a deeper relationship with the God of Israel. When the Shua, when uh, Yiftach tells his story, he he would, would talk. He'd say, you know, I was uh, I, I was born and raised in Gilead, or Gilad, and. Uh, I had three. Uh, I had three brothers. With my father had three so, three other sons, but I was born from a different mother. I was born from a prostitute, so I was really damaged goods. You know, I was. And when it came time to talk about inheritance rights, my brothers threw me out. They drove me out, and the city fathers they didn't want me either. I was. I as I said, I was damaged goods. They drove me out. My brothers drove me out. I ended up in a place called Tov. But I had leadership ability, and I gathered a gang around me, really. It was a tough area. I gathered a gang around me, a kind of a, a military kind of uh, posse. And then, sure enough, uh, the people from Gilad were under attack from the Ammonites, and they sent for me, and they asked me to come, uh, to come back and lead them militarily 
in defense against the Ammonites. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. Uh, I seem to remember, uh, what happened between me and you? Didn't you drive me out? They said, they, they said he did. And he drove a hard bargain with them. I drove a hard bargain with them. I, uh, I made them agree that they would indeed make me to be their ruler if I won this battle. And then, what do you know? The Spirit of God came upon me. The Spirit of God, this was such good news for me. Here I was damaged goods. I, w I had a mixed reputation. But the Spirit of God came upon me. And, uh, and I, uh, I'm, I, I, I won the battle. And I was appointed as the leader of, of the whole nation. Now, of course, of, of the whole city, it's really a city-state. Of course, I also demonstrated competence when I negotiated with the city fathers of Gilead. When I negotiated with the king of Ammon, he, he, he accused us of having misappropriated his land. But I knew a lot more about the history of that whole thing. I knew hundreds of years of history about that. So I just drove circles around him. So I've demonstrated in my life, thank God, that I'm a competent man, but I'm also damaged goods. I was the son of a prostitute. And then also, when God worked in my life, I did something very stupid. I made a vow that uh, if God gave me victory, I would offer as a burnt offering <laughs> whatever came out of my house. Why I did this, I don't know, but I, I was, the Spirit had come upon me and I was all juiced up, I guess. And sure enough, what came out of my house was my daughter. That was the biggest mistake of my life. Because of that, I didn't put her on an altar, but she had to be set aside, especially as a, as a symbol of dedication to God. She didn't marry, she didn't have a normal life. Uh, she lost her own options because of my stupid vow. But still, God is good. And there can be good news of victory in your life, too, if you trust in him. Now, that's how Yiftach could tell his testimony. It's supposed to be a model for us. Here's an exercise for all of us. For an example, read Yiftach's story two or three times, maybe more. And then internalize it. We're not talking about memorizing the story, because that's that's that's... Word-for-word -word memorization takes a lot of time. It's very intimidating. We're talking about internalizing the stories of the Bible, the stories of Abraham's life, other stories, internalizing them by, by reading them out loud, reading them numerous times, and then putting them in our own words, peppered with quotes from the actual Bible text. Tell the... Uh, and... and uh, Re, re, I'm suggesting that from now on, we make a habit, all of us, of reading our Bible out loud. Don't read it quietly to yourself. Read it out loud. Repeat what you read in your own words and with some quotations from the text. Internalize the story. Why should you internalize the story? Number one, it's going to really take root in you and do you a lot more good. Number two, when you're you're out with your friends when you're talking to people, you will be able to say, let me tell you a story. You're not asking them to put their nose in a Bible yet, because that's kind of intimidating. But telling them a story from the Bible in a lively way, without looking at notes or looking at a text, is extremely powerful. Look for opportunities to share these stories and your personal stories with others. Invite them to follow your lead in making the Messiah's story their own. I want to show you one more thing. I just looked up uh, in the hour before this service. So if you'll hold on a minute, I want to uh, show you something. So let's see. I've got to move something around. That's good. Thank you. And here's what I need. And here it is. All right, I'm going to turn on the screen and show you a three minute video, which brings all of this to a kind of a, of a head. So just one moment, please.
Okay, now let's see. Okay. Are we, are we, uh, let's see. Just a minuet here. What's going on? Okay. I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I cannot show this to you right now. I'm having technical difficulty. So let's, let's move on and, uh, let's move on to our, uh, our breakout groups. And, uh, just a sec. 